All right, dealing with divorce. Difficult questions, biblical answers. This is uh, lesson number seven in the series. And this particular lesson is about mixed religious marriages. Um, in a perfect world, men and women would all be Christians in, a, in the perfect world. Uh, they would all be virgins and they would then get married and then they would stay faithful to one another their whole lives and then they would die and then they would go to heaven. That's the perfect world, right? And of course, if that were the case, we wouldn't be needing this series on you know, marriage and divorce. This, this series would not be necessary. But in our present world, Christians marry non-Christians. That happens. Or non-Christians marry each other and then one of them becomes a Christian. Or one partner in a Christian couple abandons the faith, leaving the other one to carry on in the faith by themselves. Or two people who pro uh, profess faith in Christ, but they were raised in different church backgrounds, and those two people get married. So in all of these situations, there exists what we call a mixed religious marriage, and along with it, there are certain problems unique to this situation. And the first thing I want to say about that is that the, the goal here is always to create a good marriage. Because you cannot convert or change a partner who is not a Christian without first of all doing your best to create a good marriage. That's one of the main mistakes that people make when they're in a mixed religious marriage. They spend all their time trying to convert their partner instead of spending their time trying to create a good marriage. Okay? So, uh, this lesson here, uh, and I could do two or three on them, is going to review some of the problems of a mixed religious marriage and some suggestions on how you can do your best, not how you can, do your not how you can change him or her. Some people see the, the title, you know, uh, mixed religious marriage, and they say, oh great, I'm going to get some tips on how to convert my partner. No. No, this is getting tips on how to make a, a good marriage out of a marriage with two people who have different religious backgrounds. Okay? Well, let's talk about the Bible first and foremost. The Bible recognizes and accepts that such marriages exist. In first or second Corinthians, excuse me, chapter six, Paul says the following. In verse 14 he says, Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial, or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever, or what agreement has the temple of God with idols, for we are the temple of the living God, just as God has said, or just as God uh, said, I will dwell in them and walk among them and I will be their God and they shall be my people. So this passage here originally was a warning to Christians not to be yoked in a relationship with the pagans of that time. What he's saying is that Christians have no business dealing with any of the disgusting pagan practices of the times. In those days Pagan religion often involved sex orgies and all kinds of idol worship, all kinds of debauchery. And so Paul is saying, you're a Christian, what, what do you have to do with, with the pagan religions and those who follow this? Now, this passage here can include marriage to someone who was involved in a pagan lifestyle. And the point of the passage <coughs> was to avoid the activities <clears throat> excuse me, of paganism. So some have used this passage here to say that a member of the Church of Christ cannot marry a member of the Nazarene Church. And they say, well, it says it right here, you know, you know, believers can't be yoked to unbelievers. Whoever said somebody who's in the Church of the Nazarene is an unbeliever? So that's what happens when you, when you take a passage and you stretch it to make it fit what you want it to say. And to, to, to say that this passage here says 
that a member of the Church of Christ is forbidden to marry somebody who's a, a Baptist you know, is not, you know, they're, they're stretching it way too far. You're not talking about people who have a difference of what they believe about Christ. He's talking about pagans, idol worshipers, people who practiced you know, sexual orgies in their religious rites. He's talking about those kinds of people. So it, it's true that mixed religious marriages are difficult and the general principle is that we shouldn't yoke ourselves unequally. That's wise advice in general. But you know, the same is true for two people who have you know, way different temperaments or education or finance or race. There's nothing in the Bible, for example, that says a white man cannot marry a black woman. There's nothing in the Bible that says anything about that. I know there were laws in this country years ago that forbid that, but it wasn't based on the Bible. There's nothing illegal about that. The Bible doesn't forbid that. However, wise parents of both of these people will say, there's nothing that prevents you to marry, but understand that you're going to have an extra step of difficulty in your marriage. Why? Because you come from two radically different cultures. That's why. It's the same thing if someone who is very poor and grew up very poor and someone who grew up very rich and they decide to marry, they're allowed to marry, but they need to understand that they're going to have you know, some, they're going to have some issues about money and about value and about handling money because they come from totally two different places. All right, so we need to kind of understand that idea. Paul wasn't even including a Christian who married a Jew. It wasn't against the Bible if a Christian married a Jew. Would they have problems? Absolutely. All right. So 2 Corinthians deals with a believer and actually pagan things and pagan people. Not two believers with different backgrounds or even a believer with an atheist, because an atheist isn't a pagan. An atheist doesn't believe anything. A pagan believes in worshiping idols. So let's, let's get that idea straight you know, from the get-go, all right? So in 1 Corinthians 7, uh, we'll read that in a minute. In the first century, religiously mixed marriages of the extreme kind, like pagan and Christians, were present in the church. <clears throat> and Paul addresses their concern. Now he says, don't do this, right? But they, they existed at that time because many people in the first century who became Christians were already married to people who were pagans. <clears throat> so what, does he, what advice does he say to those people? Well, first of all, he says, don't divorce. Let me read the verse. He says, but to the rest I say, not the Lord, that if any brother has a wife who is an unbeliever and she consents to live with him, he must not divorce her. So in a situation like this, the believer, the Christian might have thought, well, my, my partner is a, a non-believer. I guess I have grounds for divorce. And Paul is saying to that person, no, you don't. That just because your partner is not a believer, that's not a reason to divorce them. Just because a partner becomes unfaithful religiously, this is also not grounds for divorce. Second thing, this time verse 13, he says, live in peace. Remember, he's talking to religiously mixed here. He says, live in peace. And a woman who has an unbelieving husband and he consents to live with her, she must not send her husband away. Note the common thread here is that the unbeliever wants to, leave, wants to live in peace. The acid test for staying together is not the conversion of the unbeliever, it's their willingness to live with the believer in peace despite their differences in the faith or faith and non-faith. Of course, Paul assumes that the believer will not abandon the relationship, so he puts the decision on the non-believer's shoulders. Okay. Number three, he says, your marriage is valid. He says, for the unbelieving husband is sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified through her believing husband, for otherwise your children are unclean, but now they are holy. Another passage where there's been you know, terrible 
misunderstanding. Some people think that it isn't a marriage in God's eyes if one of them is an unbeliever. Right here, Paul says that's, that's not the case. If this were true, every non-Christian couple would be living in adultery. What about two Hindus marrying? They're not Christians. Does God recognize them? Of course. God recognizes any marriage that fulfills His mandate. A man, a woman committed to living together as husband and wife for life. Whether you're a Hindu, an atheist, a Muslim, a, you know, any, anyone, that's what God requires for him to recognize a valid marriage. Whether you believe or not, it doesn't make any difference. So the marriage is valid. God also recognizes the marriage and blesses it because of the believer in, in this particular case, if it's a believer and a non-believer, blesses it in the sense that through the believing partner, the unbeliever and the children have access to the gospel. They have access to prayer. They have access to the influence of the Holy Spirit. And in this way, they are sanctified. It doesn't mean just because an unbeliever is married to a believer, the unbeliever is automatically saved. Some people have used this passage to say that. Well, that's not what he's saying. He's saying you're the only one that has the gospel, the spirit, you know, the understanding of spiritual life. The unbeliever has no other source. So in staying together, your unbelieving partner at least has a chance to be exposed to the gospel. And at least your children have a chance to be exposed to the gospel. Just like Timothy, right? His father was a Greek, right? An unbeliever. And his mother was a believer. And because of the influence of Timothy's mother and grandmother, they're the ones who taught him. You know, from an early age you have known the holy writings which are able to make you wise unto salvation, 2 Timothy 3.15. So uh, this is exactly what Paul is talking about here. The believer has influence over the unbeliever and has influence over the children. This is the sense in which they're sanctified. Number four, he says, if the unbeliever leaves, the, ma the marriage is over. Verse 15, he says, yet if the unbelieving one leaves, let him leave. The brother or the sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. So if the unbeliever leaves, the marriage is over. The believer is bound to the marriage and it is not discussed whether they would leave or not. They don't talk about the believer leaving because he's already said to the believer, if your partner is willing to live with you in faith, fine, just continue in that way. Here he's saying if your partner is willing to live with you in peace, fine, you know, don't, don't divorce them. You're the one that has access to the gospel. You, you might have influence to, to save him. And here he says, but if the unbeliever is not willing to live with you in peace, and we talked about how that means perhaps an abusive situation in a couple of lessons past, or if the unbeliever doesn't want to stay with you and leaves. He said, fine, in that case, you're not bound. So if the unbeliever leaves, Paul says, two things happen. Number one, the believer needs to let them go. Not push them out, but allow them to leave. And then he says, the believer is no longer bound to the marriage. Again, some say that this means that the believer is no longer bound to obey the husband. I've heard that. They take this passage and they say, oh, this doesn't mean divorce here. This means, well, here, the unbeliever abandons the believer. Uh, and so what Paul is saying is now the believer is no longer bound to obey the husband who's abandoned them. <laughs> or the believer is no longer bound. They don't have to have sex with their husband that has abandoned. You know, talk about stretching the meaning of a passage to fit their particular point of view. But Paul is not talking about the duty to the partner. He's talking about marriage and divorce. This whole section in Corinthians is all about marriage and divorce. Who can, when you ought to stay married, when you can divorce, and so on and so forth. Who can marry? Can widows remarry? Yes. Can divorcees remarry? Yes. You know, this, this whole section is about marriage and divorce. Why would he end the passage with this verse here and not be referring to marriage and divorce. He's been talking about marriage and divorce for the entire passage. So he ends by saying, 
If the unbeliever abandons you, let him go, he says. You are not bound. To what? Well, you're not bound in the marriage anymore. You're all alone. So he says, if the believer divorces you, let him go. You're no longer bound in that marriage. And not to do so may cause trouble. If you're not bound in marriage, what does that mean? Well, therefore, you are free to remarry. And, and I'm going to go, you know, I'll go into this more deeply because some of the other lessons uh, you know, in the future in this series we'll talk about divorce, remarriage, who can do it, why, why do people believe certain things, and other people believe certain things. We'll get into that a little later on. And then the fifth thing he says, let go when they let go. Verse 16, for how do you know, he says, O wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, O husband, whether you will save your wife? What a wise piece of advice. 2,000 years ago, and it is as pertinent, it is, it is dead on to human feelings and emotions today as it was 2,000 years ago. It's amazing. You know, he's saying it's the hope that the unbeliever will convert, but there are no guarantees for that. So long as they are with you, there's hope. But when they let go, then you need to let go too. <clears throat> Keeping them against their will, causing trouble, that's not going to save them. If they go, he says, let them. You're not guilty of divorce or guilty of losing their souls. He's talking to people and their guilt feelings. Oh dear, I didn't manage to convert him in the 10 years that we were together and he's left us, but I'm going to keep trying to go after him and maybe send him notes and visit him you know, and try to convert him and bring him back. You know? And Paul is saying, don't do that. If they abandon you, let them go. Let them go. Your main responsibility is to do your best for the marriage and give a good witness while you're in the marriage, but their soul is their responsibility, not your responsibility. Now there are other passages that deal, again, as I say, with divorce and remarriage. We'll talk about these in future lessons. But these passages give us some insight, some understanding as far as what the Bible is talking about concerning mixed religious marriages. So in 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Paul deals with the problems of mixed marriages and lays out general principles. Avoid, he says, to begin with, unequal relationships. However, if you are in one, try living in peace. And if your partner goes, let him go. Of course, if the unbeliever stays, then what do you do? How do you manage to live in peace as Paul commands? Well, um, there's a book, a, a little older book, but very good. Uh, uh, Gary and Deanna Beauchamp give uh, helpful advice and on this particular subject, if you want to read further, The Religiously Mixed Marriage. Some good ideas out of this book. So what do you do if the unbelieving partner stays and you are managing to live you know, in peace? A couple of tips. Number one, realize that God has not abandoned you. Some people feel guilty because they marry someone who is not a Christian or someone who has been raised in another religious environment, a Catholic or Baptist, whatever. Others feel separated from church friends because of their situation with a new spouse or one who has left the church. The first step is to understand that God has not forsaken or abandoned you. You're not alone. Paul says in Romans 8, but in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if all of these things cannot separate us from God's love, Certainly being married to a non-believer <laughs> or the believer of another face won't, won't separate us from God either. God is the God of the perfect, but He's also the God of the imperfect. And He will support you and love you as you work out your relationship with an unbelieving spouse. So tip number one or rule number one, realize God is with you. Number two, communicate positively about your religion with your partner. 
Since religious differences can be you know, an acute sore spot in a relationship, both partners have to learn to communicate positively about the subject when it's discussed. This means, for example, it's okay not to agree on fundamentals but be willing to express our point of view. I understand that you don't believe the way I do, you understand that I don't believe the way you do, and with that understanding, let's talk. Because you got to talk about it. Avoiding the temptation you know, to label the other person in negative terms because they're different religiously. I mean, you, you, you want to start a fist fight? Just say about your wife's religion. Well, that's dumb. What a goofy set of doctrines. Oh, your religion's all about emotion. I mean, you know, do you really, are you really trying here? <laughs> Making sure that we don't use religion as the battleground for problems that have nothing to do with religion. Getting into an argument or a fight you know, and using religion as the pretext when in reality the real problem is you were supposed to be home for supper and uh, you came in an hour late because you were at work talking with your buddies and the dinner was cold by the time you got home and you didn't even say a word. You just sat down and started eating. And then something about church you know, that you had to go to tomorrow night. Oh, I got a meeting, a men's meeting tomorrow at church. And then the fight begins. Well, the fight's not about church. <laughs> You know, the fight's about your insensitivity, your, your, your selfishness. That's what the fight is about. So the idea is you know, using religion as the pretext to fight about the kids and about money when religion has nothing to do with it. Allow the love of God and the power of the Spirit, the influence of God's word, the witness of our actions, let those be the tools by which we convince the unbelieving spouse that to believe is better than not to believe. That's true communication. Respect the things you don't agree with in religion. Respect is okay. You're not saying you believe if you respect. When I went to, to Israel many, many years ago, the, the guy took us to uh, uh, a, um, uh, the, the mosque that's on the hill uh, in Jerusalem, very you know, holy place for Muslims. And they said, you need to remove your shoes before you enter in. You're not allowed to take pictures. You have to be respectful. And we were. I removed my shoes. I, I put my camera, as, as tempting as it was to take a picture inside. Uh, you know what I'm saying? I showed respect. I don't agree with all this stuff. I think it's a false religion. But I can show respect. If you don't have respect, at least for someone else's religion, you have no way to speak to them or to, to, you know, to have any kind of influence on them. And don't judge religious motives. Don't condemn your spouse's lack of faith or wrong faith. You know, let, let's leave the judging to God, shall we? <laughs> He'll do a lot better job of it than, than we will. So if both partners understand that religion is a very delicate thing, that it needs extra effort and patience, then there will be less fighting or hurt, even if there is continued disagreement. So communicate positively about your religion. Three, act like a Christian. I mean, you guys could have written this lesson. The things are obvious. The believer is always bound to act like a believer regardless of his or her spouse. For men, this means the kind of leadership that Paul talks about in Ephesians 5 and 6. Love of the wife, ready to sacrifice for her, spiritual leadership of the family, tenderness with the children, honesty and sincerity at work, good citizenship. Those are all Christian ways. And if it's the woman who's the believer, this means sincere submission. You know, women submitting to their husbands, whether they are believers or not, that's a biblical command. It doesn't say in the Bible, wives, submit to your husbands if they're good Christians, <laughs> if they're acting properly. It says, wives, submit to your husbands, period. Now, it's not all, it, it, that is made much more difficult if the husband's a non-believer, okay? But with the help of Christ, it can be done. 
The rule of thumb, submit unless it leads you to personal sin. You know, he works six days a week, he has Sundays off, you go to Sunday church in the morning, but he wants the family to have an outing in the afternoon and you know, in the evening, go to grandma's, stuff like that. What do you do? Acting like a Christian in this context is difficult because the unbelieving partner may not understand all of your struggles and personal issues, but the best view of Christ they will get is watching you how you act, not listening to what you say. Number four, identify and keep your priorities. Let me show you the priorities list. On the left, this is the priority, God first, then your mate, whether your mate is a Christian or not. And then your children, and then the church, and then the world. When I say the world, I'm, I'm speaking of you know, your career, entertainment, vacations, voting, you know, the world. What happens is we put God first, then we put the church, and then we put the children, and then we put the spouse, and then we put the world, and then we wonder, why is everything going wrong? <laughs> why can't I influence him for Christ? Most problems in any marriage is when these priorities are skewed. Even when you have two faithful Christians, two faithful Christians sometimes you know, on the, on the right hand side, I've seen a lot of Christian couples, you know, come in for counseling, we talk about, we, what are your priorities? Oh, God is first, and then of course the church is next, you know? and then while well, the children are important, and then the spouse comes forth, and I say, oh, sorry, got that backwards. I've told my children, and some of them are here today, as they were growing up, I was here before you got here, and I will be here after you leave home. As far as your mother is concerned, so your mother's first for me, and I'm first for her. I, actually, your mother is second for me. God is first. But your mother is, comes next. And in her life, God is first, and then I come next. And then you come, and then the church, and then the career. That's how that works. When both partners know that these are the Christian priorities, it helps you know, make sense of the actions that are being taken. Number five, try to understand the unbeliever. Most effort is directed at getting the unbeliever to understand Christianity or doctrines or church life. The effort needs to be the other way around. The Christian spouse needs to make an extra effort to understand what the non-believer feels. They're not like you in faith and practice. They need to be understood, not to change them, but rather to know and to empathize and to love them better. Because understanding will minimize criticism and open up a whole new avenue in the relationship. So here are some common complaints and concerns, not of believers, here are some common complaints of non-believing or no longer believing or different believing spouses. The most common complaints, ready? Lack of comfort. They're not comfortable with religious services. They're not comfortable with Christian social activities. Why? They don't want to do the wrong thing. They don't want to say, the, they don't want to look stupid. They feel uncomfortable because they think that church members are spotting them or judging them as second class citizens. Oh, you're Mary's husband, yeah. And then you know, in between, the guy who's never here. <laughs> the guy who doesn't allow her to go to the women's retreat because it conflicts with his hunting weekend. Oh, you're that guy. They feel betrayed. For some, they feel betrayed because their mate has a stronger attachment to the church and their Christian friends than to them. You love your Christian buddies more than you love me. No, I don't. Sure you do. You spend way more time with them than you do with me. And it's especially true when the mate becomes a Christian 
after marriage. Oh, that's traumatic. Because everything changes all of a sudden. Habits, activities, friends. You know, you're going along great for seven years. Yeah, it's great. We're having a great time. Marriage is wonderful, blah, blah, blah. A little kid comes along, God. number two comes along. Man, I'm sure I love you, you're the best. What a great marriage. And all of a sudden, somebody becomes a Christian. They go to a meeting, they study with a friend, they have a home Bible study, blah, 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 and they become a Christian. And they say, guess what, I'm a Christian. Okay, so I won't be here Sunday morning anymore. <laughs> I won't be at home. You know when we used to sit in bed and read the paper and have coffee? I'm not doing that anymore. I'm going to church now. Okay, I want to be supportive. Oh yeah, and I'm not going to be here Wednesday nights either because you know, we have church service on Wednesday. Oh, all right. I don't know about you, but I would feel betrayed. What happened to my wife? Where'd my wife go? Man, a lot of stress, a lot of hurt. Self-persecution, non-Christian spouses, you know, they still have to deal with sin and fear and guilt and shame and disappointment in themselves, but they don't have the comfort of the cross. They don't have avenue of prayer. There's no final solution to their spiritual problems that they feel but may not be able to articulate yet. They don't accept Christ as the solution to their problems but they still suffer the consequences of their problems. While their mate is, tra la la, I'm going to heaven. <laughs> panic, panic. Some feel that their partner is moving ahead of them or is committing themselves to someone or something that they are not part of. And their response is usually one of three. Well, I'll just get some extra hobbies. A lot of men, you know, their, their wives gone Sunday morning. So Sunday morning, they, they figure out a new hobby. They go to, I don't know, a coffee joint and read the paper by themselves. I don't know. They just figure something else to do with their time. Or I'll cause trouble. <laughs> Every Sunday morning, I'm going to do something that's going to interfere with the preparation of my wife and the two kids to go to church. I'm going to say, hey, 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 you didn't iron my shirt. I need the shirt today. You know, well, honey, it's 20. I'm going to be late. Oh, I need my shirt. You know, passive aggressive stuff. Or, or, well, she seems happier. She seems more at peace with herself. I've met some of these Christian people. They've accepted me. They, they just, you know, maybe there's something there. Maybe there's something there for me and they follow along. We're hoping that, that that's what will happen. But we need to understand when that doesn't happen, you know, the non-believer or the different believer person, they're going through a, quite a traumatic time. Feelings of resentment. Religion is stupid. It's wasting my partner's life, my family's time, and my family's money. I remember back in Montreal, this is no word of a lie, a woman had been faithful at church for 25 years. She went to church, same church, and her husband was not a non-believer, right to the bitter end. She died, she was buried, and he sued the church to get back all the money that she had contributed for the 25 years. I mean, ugh. he was still, you know, he was still mad at her in the grave. He didn't win, I mean. You know, the lawyer laughed at him. You know. <laughs> Could you imagine? But that's how, that's how upset he was. And so resentment, it causes nothing but arguments and it makes both the unbeliever and the believer depressed. Prejudice, my wife's church are fanatics. I married a fanatic and I don't want to become a fanatic. And of course, struggle for control. It's one thing for my spouse to believe in this, but what about my children? So then you start having debates about how many times a week you go to church, his church, her church. You don't want the children to be indoctrinated. I don't want my kids to be brainwashed with this Christianity stuff or your brand of Christianity stuff. So all of these and other feelings are legitimate concerns for the unbeliever and they need to be addressed whether they are converted or not. If it's the wife, 
she needs to understand that this is what he's going through and she needs to you know, deal with that. I tell men, excuse me, I tell women you know, who are getting married or having issues in their marriage, you know, what does my husband want? You know, I, I, never, I don't know what he wants. You know, and I tell them, more than anything else, reassurance. <laughs> he needs reassurance that he's like number two, he's still number two. There's God and there's still him. And then men say, well, what about me? What, what do, what do, my wife, what does she need? Reassurance. She needs to be reassured that she's still number two. Every wife, every husband receives that reassurance in one way or another, but reassurance, so, so, so very important. For, uh, Solutions, we go back to Paul's original, you know, solutions to these problems, we go back to Paul's original ideas, avoid unequal relationships, and if you're in one, strive for peace and unity in the marriage first. In other words, you'll never convert your partner if you do not have a stable, <coughs> happy marriage. So we get messed up because we focus all our energy on converting first, thinking it'll solve the marriage problems, and it's the other way around. First, solve the marriage problems, and you might have a chance at conversion. So if we work first on keeping the peace and submission, good leadership, positive communication, sincere understanding of our unbelieving spouse's concerns and feelings, we'll build a good marriage, and then perhaps the stage will be set for accepting the gospel. Note that Paul holds the believer responsible for building a marriage in peace, not for the faithfulness of the partner or their conversion. You understand what I just said? What he holds, his readers who are in mixed marriage, mixed religious marriages, he holds the believer responsible for creating a good marriage, not for converting the spouse. That's number two. So the believer in a mixed marriage what is their role in the church? Well, a Christian in a mixed marriage feels alone, hard to relate to other couples, can't participate in a lot of activities because of the situation. So how do I grow as a Christian? How do I minister? Very quickly at the end, find your gift and use it. In other words, you're in a mixed religious marriage. How do I serve in the church? Well, find what you can do and then just do it. Maybe ministering to people of like situation, you know, been there, done that, let me help you with that. Or teach your own children to the degree that you're able, very important. And then of course, prayer ministry. You, you, you don't need to have a believing partner in order for you to have a successful and dynamic prayer ministry in the church. I finish here with just a quick little story. Uh, a fellow named Ernie in a church back in Canada, went to church with his wife for 25 years, every Sunday, every Wednesday. He was not a believer, never been baptized, every Sunday, every Wednesday. He was more faithful to services than half of the, <laughs> half of the congregation. He was always there. And he was there for so long, he became part of the congregation because he'd go to the potlucks and you know, go to the picnics and everything that un, uh, they didn't get this. Some of the men invited him to come and be part of the men's meeting to decide you know, the color of the carpet and should we buy a, a new school bus or you know, whatever. He was part of that meeting and he gave his opinion. And finally, one of the old timers you know, said to the men's meeting, because they had no elders, that's how they kind of ran things, Finally, one of the old timers said to them, hey, what are you doing with Ernie on the committee? He, he's not a member of the church. What? No, he's never been baptized. 25 years. But she kept at it slowly. And then one day, and every preacher that preached for that church, they would target that guy. Oh man, got to get a notch in my gun. You know? They all failed. They tried everything with him. And one day he was just sitting there listening to another lesson and it just popped in his mind. He realized, he said to me, I realized that I had gotten to the point that I was refusing to be baptized, not because I didn't believe, but because I was just being pig-headed. 
I didn't want other people to think, oh, you finally gave in, we won. You know? And he said, I realized, am I, am I crazy? This is my soul here. This is not a game. And he called up the preacher and he said, okay, I'm ready. And I mean, the preacher nearly fell over. What? Ready for what? <laughs> I'm ready to be baptized. And he was, and they're still, he's still faithful. I bump into him at lectureships from time to time. So the, you know, the motto here, of the, the, not the motto, but the, the lesson here is don't lose hope. You know, sometimes it's a very long process. Don't lose hope. You just be the best Christian you can be and try to create the very best marriage that you can and leave the rest to God and the Spirit working. Okay, that's it. We'll continue next week.